Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, February 24th. I'm Katie Balls, the Spectator's Deputy Political Editor and your host this week. On this week's show... Russia has invaded Ukraine and on Thursday morning launched attacks across the country, including in the capital of Kiev. I'll get the latest from James Forsyth and Kate Andrews, hear about what drives Vladimir Putin from Owen Matthews and the historian Orlando Fijas, and discuss what we can learn from the Cold War with the author and former Pentagon advisor Hal Brands. After all that, we'll turn to COVID. The last legal restrictions were lifted this week. Matt Ridley will tell us what he thinks and we'll discuss respiratory diseases like COVID and whether they become milder over time. And to finish, we'll look to Canada. Why has Justin Trudeau decided to use emergency powers to stop the trucker protests? Before we get going, a very special thank you to Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management who are sponsoring the Week in 60 Minutes. Canaccord are experienced wealth planners and investment managers who go above and beyond to offer you support and guidance. Just visit candowealth.com to find out more. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel too, click the red subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. In the early hours of this morning, Russia invaded Ukraine, bombarding the country of airstrikes and troop deployments from the north, south and the east. To talk through the latest and give us an insight into what Putin might be thinking, I'm joined by Owen Matthews, the Spectator's Russia correspondent, and the historian Orlando Fijas. Owen Orlando, thanks for joining Spectator TV. Owen, in this week's magazine, you uh, wonder whether ultimately Putin has lost the plot. Are you surprised by his decision to launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine? Um, I'm, I'm not just surprised. Um, I'm completely flabbergasted, but actually more importantly than me, um, I've just spent the whole morning um, uh, on Twitter and Signal and uh, Facebook and uh, with all my Russian contacts, several, many of whom have worked in the Putin apparat, in the diplomatic service, in, the, in his media machine for two decades. And the Russians are amazed. I mean, people who think they know what's going on you know, top journalists, people who work for Putin in the Kremlin, who have been supporting his propaganda effort for years, they are surprised. And they actually didn't think it was going to happen. Basically, Sunday, everyone was still on the diplomatic channel. Lavrov, you know, everyone was all calling uh, Western claims of an imminent invasion hysteria. And then it suddenly changed. And there's two explanations for that. Either that the diplomacy was a bluff and war was a plan all along, but, um, or that uh, something changed in principle and Putin decided at the last minute for reasons that are very hard to fathom to completely abandon not just diplomacy, but apparently all kind of self-interest. Because I think... What we, one thing that we have been saying all along, uh, both Orlando and I, is actually true, is that the one scenario in which he absolutely loses all the diplomatic leverage that he has, all of the strategic ambiguity that he's built up, all of the allies that he's been cultivating inside Europe in his divide and conquer, all of that he loses with a full-scale invasion and he's invaded. It's totally inexplicable and completely counterproductive as I see it. Orlando, are you also perplexed by recent events? Yes, I'm shocked and saddened and disgusted, um, as everybody is. Um, and we're at a point where we really can't tell what's in Putin's planning. Um, we can certainly tell what he's been reading and what he's been saying and the sort of ideologies that um, he's been playing with that have led him to this point. Um, I think that he has um, moved in an imperial direction in terms of sort of civilizational thinking. He's taken on board a lot of ideas from uh, people like Carl Schmitt to believe that uh, uh, there are hegemonic states of which Russia is one and there are other entities like Ukraine which are not even to be given uh, sovereign status. Um, so he's been perhaps isolated too long, reading too many weird Nazi jurists and other ideologists of a pan-Slav Eurasian ilk that would lead him in this direction to think that he is able to do this. 
Um, is that a sign of madness, of dislocation from reality? Uh, I think probably it is, in which case I think like many uh, Russian rulers of that nature that have embarked on foreign adventures before, and I'm thinking of Nicholas I and the First Crimean War, it will mean the end of his regime fairly quickly. On the other hand, um, all the signs are, and the confidence of uh, rhetoric would suggest, that they've been planning this for a very, very long time. So I think that he still has a lot of levers to pull, he still has a lot of influence to call upon, and he still has a number of threats to make, perhaps even to our own political establishment or any political establishment that tries to cross him. So, you know, this is a KGB war as well as um, a Ministry of Defence war. Um, and it's, it's a war in which everything is weaponized. Um, disinformation, social media, cyber warfare, as well as troops on the ground and, and all the deployments we've seen in the last few hours. So who knows? Who knows where we are? It's, it, it would be a fool now to say that they thought they knew what was going to happen next. And Orlando, just on the historical perspective here, I wonder, I mean, you mentioned how ultimately Putin, um, in, in how he is speaking and how he sees things, he's suggesting that Ukraine is not a country, it's part of greater Russia effectively. Um, can you talk us a bit more through his perspective on this and, and ultimately where greater Russia ends? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the article that everyone cites is his long piece, slightly bizarre piece um, that the Kremlin published last year, July 2021. And uh, he's really repeating a number of strands that he's already made in his, in his, in his speeches and articles, namely that um, Russia and Ukraine and Belarus are all one nation. They all share the same foundation in Kiev and Rus. Um, so we saw this really come to the fore in 2016 when he opened this monument to the Grand Prince Vladimir in Moscow, who, of course, is also claimed by the um, uh, Ukrainians as the founder of their European state. For Putin, he's the founder of the great Russian state, of which a tripartite state, if you like, of which Belarus and Ukraine are one. So this is his civilizational thinking I was referring to. And in that foundation myth, there's no place for a Ukrainian statehood. This, again, is something that, you know, the ideas of Carl Schmitt that he's been borrowing from uh, feed into. The idea that, that, that um, uh, only certain cultural national formations have statehood at their heart. So Russia has a statehood and Ukraine has always been, for Putin, um, just a borderland. Ukraina, the, the original Slav word for Ukraine just does mean borderland. And so it's... Uh, and then in other articles, Putin has said, for example, that, you know, Ukraine as a nation state was invented by the Bolsheviks. So that, you can see, given the historiography he comes from, basically Soviet, you can see sort of where he's coming from. I mean, it's mad, but his argument is that it was only uh, the Bolsheviks in drawing up the constitution of the Soviet Union that Ukraine was given its first nationhood. Well, the Ukrainians would say nonsense. They, they would trace their nationhood back to Kiev and Rus, or they would trace their nationhood back to the Cossack hetmanate of the 17th century, which looked for help from Russia originally, or they would point to the independent Ukraine of 1917 to 18 which very quickly became a German puppet state and then got embroiled in civil war before the, the uh, Soviet Union was formed with a Soviet Republic as part of it. So, uh, Ukrainian Soviet Republic. So you can see that it's, it's a whole mishmash of historical ideas and ideologies that Putin is weaponizing here or drawing from to justify his, his sort of world view of, of Russia as a hegemonic state and Ukraine as simply... Um, a subordinate state, if you like, or a subordinate entity, which, which has to be included in a bigger civilization. That's how I think he, he views the world. Um, and it, it is wacky. It is, it is mad. It is certainly not fit for purpose in a, in, in a post-1991 world where we do live by, um, we hope, you know, international standards and principles of sovereignty. Um, but that is just not how Putin um, has come to see it, um, unfortunately. And Owen, where is, I suppose, Russian uh, public opinion on this? Is there a sense amongst the people that, you know, Ukraine is a part of Russia or, you know, should be uh, more in, in lock sync with it? Well, um, 
Uh, well, let, first, I mean, j just to Orlando's point, I mean, something, um, an analogy that might be more familiar to, to uh, English or British uh, viewers is actually the very ambiguous relationship between Britain in the First World War and Ireland, for instance, or, or a longer term, the, the, the Scottish Kingdom's flirtation with France. It's always the, the, the relationship between Russia and Ukraine is of close neighbours which have at various points been part of the same state which have been flirting with enemies and are flirting with enemies. Now the, 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 the really big question is uh, will Russia's very rushed, very amateurish, very last minute propaganda campaign manage to swing a majority of Russian opinion behind uh, a full-scale invasion. I don't think so far, um, I personally don't believe that a long-term occupation of all of Ukraine is anything that Vladimir Putin is contemplating. It's certainly not what he's preparing his people for. Uh, but the uh, clearly defending Donbass and the Russians of the eastern Ukraine against genocide is now the line. Um, uh, depressingly, it seems that Russian viewers claim in p public opinion surveys to be quite fantastically gullible and uh, with the program. So the very latest polls that have come out say that 50% uh, at least support the war. But um, the, the, the reliability of polls is always a big dis is always a big question mark because, for instance, the uh, Vetsa EOM the state-controlled polling center, not the independent Levada one, but literally the state-controlled one, uh, came up with a poll when they open-endedly ask Russians to name a politician, politician they trust, only 21% say uh, Vladimir Putin. When you ask them on a multiple choice, which of these politicians do you trust most, then Putin comes out at 68%. So is his support 21% or is it 68%? It depends how you ask the question. It's a very ambiguous issue. Um, now, so far, um, the messaging has in the past worked. In 2008, it was a question of you know, the Georgians have attacked South Ossetia and the Russian public were able to believe that package, which was in fact somewhat true, the Georgians did attack South Ossetia briefly, um, that Russia was responding to a provocation. In Crimea, there was a gigantic preamble. There was actually three months of profound unrest in Kiev. Um, the um, revolution of dignity, as the Ukrainians call it, the, the, the uh, effective as a democratic people power coup against the pro-Russian government of Viktor Yanukovych was presented as a fascist coup. And there was lots of time to prepare the Russians for that. Here, all of those arguments about the fascists in, in, in Kiev, about aggression, has been compressed into 48 hours. It's amazingly rushed. It's as though they've just sort of decided to sort of run out of the building and just grab every single ideological argument that they have and off the shelf and just sort of throw it at the Russian public and see what will happen and whether it'll stick. I mean, I think that there is a profound uh, ambiguity uh, and there's a, a ambivalence, I would say, between the relationship in the relationship between Russians and Ukrainians because they actually have, so many Ukra Russians have close family ties with Ukraine. I mean, they do indeed consider Ukraine to be part of their own country in many ways. And that's a very common attitude that it's just sort of a little part of our, of our great nation. Uh, but that argument has to, that, 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 that's a stick with two ends, as the Russians say, is that um, the Russians consider it part of their country. Does that mean that they're actually going to allow their sons or be happy about their sons going to war against Ukrainian ordinary people? I don't know. It's the most, uh, I mean, what, what the one thing it is clear is that this is the most severe and extreme stress test that Russian propaganda has ever had to face. And if Putin loses it, then that really is the end of his regime. If, and and he's, he's started it in an extraordinarily rushed, amateurish way, which has amazed and shocked even most Russians, even those that even many Russians who support him. And, and just briefly on that, one of the points you've made when you've been covering this crisis is that you thought uh, a full-scale invasion was unlikely because ultimately Putin had not been preparing the people for it. Have we seen in the past you know, few days him start to do that? Do you think the Russian people are prepared for the war that he has now announced? Well, that's, um, the, the messaging has changed. I mean, it hasn't changed to let's incorporate uh, Ukraine into Russia. That's not the messaging. Um, the messaging is 
let's defend the, the Russians of Eastern Ukraine from fascists and genocidal killers in the form of um, Ukrainian nationalists. So, I mean, even at the moment, uh, e e even now that there's been this sort of step change, this complete sort of pivot towards an actual invasion, the messaging in Russian state media is still not a full-scale invasion. It's about punishing the fascists for launching an aggressive war, as the Russian media has been portraying it, against the Russian-speaking peoples of eastern Ukraine. And Orlando, just finally, um, if we have a situation where we talked a lot about the risk here in terms of, uh, you know, Putin announcing this, where it could go very wrong for him, why this is by far one of the most tricky paths he could have picked, the, the most difficult, in fact. But were this to go to plan for Putin, what does that look like? And what is he trying to do in terms of uh, writing his legacy and changing Russian history? Well, we don't know what his plan is. I mean, uh, 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 so we can't really say. Uh, but the, I think Owen's point is a good one about, um, you know, support, whether this would be um, coming from the Russian population. I mean, still 70% of the population is entirely dependent on television for its news. So he can control that increasingly aged part of the population. Um, but I, I'm, I, but I'm, I, I, and I'm sceptical about whether um, there's going to be a big anti-war movement in Russia because he's crushed civil society so effectively and it's so fragmented that people have become despondent. So we'll see, we'll see about that, whether he can see it through. Um, and I don't think there can be a success for Putin from, from this point on. And, and, and I, I, I think and very much hope it spells the end of his regime. And I suspect, coming back to this, this rhetoric of defending the Russian people from genocide, etc., I suspect that that has actually more to do with Putin's own a uh, weirdly twisted reading of of post cold war history and his 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 attempt to get back at the west for what he sees probably as the beginning of all of this confrontation with the west which is kosovo because if you remember it nato went into kosovo uh, supposedly to save the Albanians from genocide, uh, from the Serbian Milosevic regime. And, and I think that's the point at which the Russians see the beginning of this uh, new confrontation, this new Cold War, if you like, with the West. So it's almost as if he's saying we, as if he's saying to the West in his own um, ideological thinking, his echo chamber, as, as, as Owen put it in his piece, it's almost as if he's saying to the West, you know, I, I'm going to fight you by, uh, uh, by your own principles. I'm going to call out the genocide you're your 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 bringing about to, to our Russian speakers, our people, as he would put it, um, although they're of course uh, citizens of a sovereign state, um, and and this is um, so now divorced from reality that one wonders who it's going to convince, um, other than himself and and. Um, the sort of mad ideologists who surround him or who've been um, influencing his thinking. And, and I doubt even whether it will convince... I mean, will Lavrov really be convinced by this sort of um, rhetoric as uh, the occupation of Ukraine becomes more and uh, more and more bloody and messy. I, I don't know. I, I suspect it will probably uh, accelerate any fragmentation of his own regime between, you know, hawks and doves, between those who may want to return to the diplomatic path rather than uh, get Russia um, deeper and deeper into this mire um, into which it's now launched itself. Thank you, Orlando. Thank you, Owen. What does the invasion mean for relations between Russia and the West? And what can we learn from the Cold War, the last time the West had to confront the Kremlin? I'm joined by James Forsyth, our political editor, and Hal Brandis, a former Pentagon advisor and the author of The Twilight Struggle, what the Cold War teaches us about great power rivalry today. Hal, your book, The Twilight Struggle, looks at what we can uh, learn from the Cold War in terms of relations with Russia and China today. Um, what do you make of this, uh, I think someone said, you know, this um, blossoming relationship between uh, Russia and China in, in recent weeks and months. I think the best way to conceive of this is that Russia and China are pursuing uh, parallel and uh, perhaps increasingly convergent challenges to the international system. And so both of them are challenging the United States for their own reasons. Uh, and so they don't necessarily have to get together in order to do that, but they are getting together in a more significant way. And so we've seen growing 
cooperation in the economic, diplomatic, technological, and military realms of, of a sort, of, I think, that would have surprised many uh, Western observers had it been predicted 10 to 20 years ago. At the same time, it's simply the existence of the other country's challenge makes life easier for Beijing or Moscow. And so the fact that the Russians are putting pressure on Western positions in Ukraine and Eastern Europe creates distraction that Beijing can profit from in the Western Pacific uh, and vice versa. And so this isn't a formal alliance, but it doesn't actually need to be a formal alliance to cause a lot of strategic headaches for the West. And how, what do you think we can learn from the Cold War looking ahead to, as you mentioned, you know, something which might not be so different if we're looking at the various tensions in going forward? Well, I think one of the more sobering lessons is that while we would certainly like to drive wedges between Russia and China, that's probably not going to be possible for the time being. This is perhaps a negative lesson from the Cold War. And so everyone wants to pull the reverse Kissinger to find a way of peeling Putin away from Xi Jinping and using him as a tool of containing China. What we often forget is that the earlier Sino-Soviet uh, split preceded the U.S. opening to China, and it wasn't until China and the Soviet Union fought a fairly sharp border war in 1969 that that U.S. opening to China became possible. The, the hard fact of the matter is that while there are tensions and there are divergent interests between Russia and China today, there's nothing on the scale of tensions that would uh, convince Putin to fundamentally reorient Russian strategy. Those tensions may come to the surface over time. That's what happened during the Cold War. But I think we're talking about something that might manifest during the 2030s in a post-Putin era rather than today. And um, James, is the West as ready for this, uh, you know, uh, so-called great power rival as they were for the Cold War? I, I think not. I think defence spending is low. And I think that there is a question about uh, Western, you know, if you look at European countries, they have essentially spent their Cold War peace dividend on health and welfare spending. It's very hard to unwind that with ageing populations. So how do you do that? And then I think there is also the fact that Europe is going to have to take a lot more responsibility for its security. Uh, I think you know, we are seeing a gradual US withdrawal from Europe as it has to focus more on the threat that China poses to it uh, in, in, in the Pacific, as Hal was saying. And so you, know, you look at the role that Biden has played in this crisis, you know, the pressure he put on Germany to cancel Nord Stream 2, the rallying effect that US deployed has had. You know, European powers are going to have to start doing that for themselves. And that is, that is going to be a challenge because I think if you look at the way Europe has handled this crisis strategically, you know, the, the way that I think Emmanuel Macron has been slightly played by Vladimir Putin in this crisis, you know, there are questions about how ready Europe is to take on more responsibility for its own security. How do you think that Putin sees an opportunity in the sense that he believes America is weakened uh, compared to where it was, uh, you know, a few decades ago? Where, uh, if you think about Russia in the nineties, um, there's you know some such as Fiona Hill, former advisor to Donald Trump, saying that Putin uh, effectively uh, sees uh, America as where Russia was in the nineties now. Well, he certainly knows that the balance of power has shifted from where it was, say, in the early post-Cold War era, when Russia was flat on its back and the United States was simply unchallenged. And, and he's right about that. America is still uh, by far the strongest country in the world, but its advantages are not as pronounced as they were in the mid-1990s or the mid-2000s. And so particularly in regions near Russia's borders, or near China's borders for that, for that matter, it gives uh, autocratic powers greater room for maneuver. I think in the more immediate crisis, Putin probably judged that the United States wasn't so much weak as distracted, that, that it was desperate for calm on non-Asian fronts so it could pay more attention to the Chinese challenge. That may have encouraged him to push a little bit harder in Ukraine, calculating that he would get a relatively weak response. James, what role do you think NATO expansion has played in this? Do you think that you can say that it has um, you know, led Putin to take a more confrontational, um, aggressive approach? I think what Putin is really worried about with Ukraine is Ukraine's you know, becoming a successful democracy, its Western orientation. I, I think if you took Ukraine membership of NATO off the table, that would not be enough for Vladimir Putin. But I think you also see something else here, which is that Putin is an opportunist, not a strategist. One of the things he did with the annexation of Crimea is he changed the political balance within Ukraine to make Ukraine a more Western-orientated 
country. And I think that is, that is an example of him failing to see things. I also think that what we are, what we are seeing is, uh, in Ukraine is the dangers of not being a NATO member. You know, why are the Baltic states, which you know, are former socialist Republic, Soviet republics as well, why are they more secure? Because they are covered by the NATO nuclear umbrella. So, you know, if Putin is trying to suggest to countries that they shouldn't join NATO, he's actually de de providing a textbook demonstration of why countries want to do this. I also think another risk here is that, you know, Ukraine famously gave up its nuclear weapons at the end of the Cold War. I think anyone watching what is happening to Ukraine will think, well, was that the correct strategic decision? It is. They are still your ultimate guarantor of safety. How, what do you think is the thing or the factor that would be the most impactful in uh, causing Putin to stop, uh, think again, recalibrate, perhaps take a different path? I mean, you've seen Western leaders um, almost being quite coordinated this week, questioning his judgment, suggesting he's acting in a deranged manner. Um, do you think that could have any effect? Well, I don't know if he's deranged or not, but I think it is entirely possible that you know, when you take the use of military force off the table, which I think was a reasonable thing to do, that there just may not be uh, a combination of costs that the West can generate that would prevent Putin from going ahead with further aggression within Ukraine. Putin may simply have decided that whatever economic costs or whatever diplomatic costs the United States and others can impose on him are not greater than the cost that he would suffer if he allowed Ukraine to continue to develop as a democracy and, and draw closer to the West. And so he may be simply be operating in loss aversion territory here, which drives him to do relatively aggressive things. Now, now Putin may be miscalculating. He, he may misunderstand the extent to which he is going to promote a more vigorous, more united NATO with greater U.S. and European military presence on his borders. He may be underestimating the effect to which He's pushing countries like Finland and Sweden to rethink uh, their status vis-a-vis -vis NATO and perhaps eventually to join that alliance. And so he may be wrong, but that may not do us any good in the current crisis. And James, um, just uh, reaching the end of this discussion, do you think there's a chance that after weeks of, you know, the UK particularly, but, you know, other allies too, talking really tough about the action they're going to take, that we're now entering a stage, given that Putin is taking action, we expect that he could go further, that uh, certain countries and perhaps the West in general starts to look quite impotent? I think Hal is right that we are seeing, if you are not prepared to use military force, there is limits to how much leverage you have, especially given that Putin is convinced, first of all, that the West is not prepared to boycott Russian energy supplies. And secondly, that Putin thinks that the Western public are not prepared to take a kind of prolonged pain. You know, it was quite clear in that, that bizarre televised National Security Council meeting on Monday that, you know, that Putin has convinced himself that when it comes to sanctions, you know, A, Russia can ride them out, and B, the West is not prepared to take as much pain on itself as it would need to be for these sanctions to be, you know, to be truly devastating to the Russian economy. So I, I think that there are challenges there, but I also think that uh, the opportunity for the West is to, uh, it is more united, I don't think people would have expected Germany to cancel Nord Stream 2 in the way that it would have done even a few months ago. So if the West can respond in a more united fashion than expected, I think it could it has the potential to impose deeper economic consequences on Russia than Putin was perhaps expecting. And I think the other thing that you saw on that Monday meeting is Putin is not someone who is listening to anybody else right now. This was not someone interested in listening to bad news or caution. And I think that the other thing Putin might be underestimating is how determined Ukrainians are to fight. And how, just finally, um, not quite ending on a cheery note, but I wondered what do you think is a, a reasonable worst case scenario for the West when it comes to the situation going forward? Well, the worst case scenario is that you get significant economic fallout from sanctions and counter sanctions, which adds to inflationary pressures and which starts to create cracks in the unity of the West as people deal with the prospect of prolonged economic pain. But, but worse than that would be you get further uh, escalation in the cyber realm or perhaps in the military realm out, out of the current uh, conflict. That, that's not entirely unthinkable. I, I think that it's unlikely this would lead to a clash between Russia and NATO countries. But you, you can trace paths by which 
that would happen if, if the United States and other countries decide to provide arms to a Ukrainian insurgency and uh, the Russians decide to try to stop that by clearing out the insurgency's sanctuaries across the border in a NATO state. Again, I think that that's unlikely, but it is thinkable. And so we need to be imagining some of these worst case scenarios. James, you're going to stay with us. Hal, thanks for joining. In an address to the nation today, the Prime Minister said the UK and its allies would continue to support Ukraine through sanctions and through providing defence as weaponry. Boris Johnson also labelled Vladimir Putin as a dictator. So what will the fight back look like? And with most of Europe dependent on Russian gas, will there be a blowback against Britain's economy? Kate Andrews, the Spectator's economics editor, joins me and James to talk about the latest in Westminster. James... Russia dominates in Westminster this week, but it's also uh, the return of MPs after recess. And it's been a tricky few months clearly for Boris Johnson. How has this position uh, changed as uh, Russia and Ukraine has um, become the main issue of the day? The main issue of the day. Well, it, it has provided a different lead story. It has allowed Boris Johnson to be the statesman on the world stage. I think up until the, the f announcement of the first tranche of sanctions earlier this week, Boris Johnson had quite a good crisis. I think the general reaction in Parliament and among Tory MPs too was that the first set of sanctions the UK announced w was underwhelming. Now, obviously there are now going to be further sanctions because Russia has launched this all-out assault on Ukraine. Uh, but, you know, I think those initial set of sanctions were underwhelming. Obviously also on Monday we had the announcement that from today, Thursday, all the COVID restrictions in England are gone. I think Boris Johnson wants to put a, thinks that that is something that both pleases his MPs. I think he also thinks it will have economic benefits. And there is another aspect of this, which is, you know, if COVID restrictions are a thing of the past, I think some of those around him hope that will take some of the emotional energy out of the, the allegations about uh, whether Boris Johnson himself, uh, which I'll be looked at by the police, whether Boris Johnson himself breach those COVID rules uh, in Downing Street. Now, I mean, there's only a limited amount of truth to that in that people's emotional experiences of lockdown are, are still so strong and still so recent in their memories. But I think that Boris Johnson certainly hopes that having done that, uh, he has put some credit in the bank with Tory MPs. One thing that those Tory MPs very close to Boris Johnson say is, you know, look, on Monday, every Tory MP's contribution in that statement was supportive. And it's been a long time since Boris Johnson has had that. And Kate, just briefly on sanctions, because we've got a lot of Russia coming up in this episode. Um, can you talk us through the economic impact that sanctions like to have on the UK? Because it's something Biden's warned about, but we haven't heard so much about Bo from Boris Johnson on the issue. So the, it's quite clear that from the original statements that were made, as James says, Tory MPs didn't think that the UK was going far enough. Boris Johnson would probably say, look, I have to leave myself some room in case things get worse, which they now obviously have done. But there was definitely a sense that those sanctions weren't going to be most acutely felt by the British people, that this was obviously uh, uh, sanctions that were, were, were meant to be um, at the starting baseline of what they otherwise could be. It was Europe that was really going to feel that economic pain in particularly Germany, deciding to um, pause at least the certification of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. A really big moment actually, because that will have frustrated Vladimir Putin quite a lot. He was expecting to get billions of, of dollars of revenue out of that. Um, now that was going to cause a domestic crisis, an energy crisis for Germany, but now that things are escalating and war is very, very real. We can see the economic impact far more clearly. I mean, oil is skyrocketing. It's now over $100 a barrel. And if we start to talk about real sanctions, really cutting Russia out of international markets in, in, in a very tough way, that is obviously going to have a knock-on impact on consumers around the world. And this is a difficult time for governments to be selling that line because we have inflation going up. The cost of living is, is definitely being felt ac acutely here in the UK places like the US as well, um, the, the people like Biden looking at the midterms, uh, his own possibility of re-election. These are tough arguments to sell to a public because, you know, as you crack down on trade, you inevitably hurt both sides. But uh, I think there's definitely a sense in the UK and certainly in the US post-Afghanistan and the way that even during the 2020 election, Trump and Biden were very much in agreement that the US had to pull back and stop being so much of the world's policemen, that these options are better than putting boots on the ground and actually going to war with Russia. 
And James, where's Keir Starmer all, in all this? Because uh, the Labour leader is very keen to talk about Ukraine, uh, pushing obviously Boris Johnson to go even further on sanctions. Um, what's he trying to do here? I think Keir Starmer is trying to show that Labour is now a responsible opposition and to put distance between his Labour Party and, and that of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, it is hard to imagine that Jeremy Corbyn would be responding so unequivocally to the situation in Ukraine. I mean, you can see in Jeremy Corbyn's statements there are kind of far more suggestions that, that, that NATO expansion has not been, ha, has provoked this crisis and the like. Keir Starmer is trying to say, you know, that is not how he thinks and is trying to stress, you know, his seriousness. Look at the fact that he's visited NATO during this crisis uh, and, and the like. I think there is an interesting political question here, which is, as Kate says, this is obviously going to make the cost of living crisis worse. Energy prices are going to go up higher. Pet prices at the petrol pump are going to go higher. Um, how does the public think about that? Does the public think? Uh, does the public feel more angry with the government because its real uh, real take home income is continuing to is falling more sharply, or do the public think? Well, look, this is this is this is because of Russia's decision to uh, invade Ukraine. And Kate, uh, you've mentioned how clearly war is going to have an economic impact, um, but bigger picture, I suppose, in terms of the long term plan, uh, Rishi Sunak has uh, given a lecture this week. Can you tell us what he's been saying? Sure. So the, the Chancellor gave what on the surface is quite a technical business lecture, but I think is the closest we've gotten so far to a Rishi Sunak manifesto. And there have been a lot of questions over the past few months with the Prime Minister ridden with scandal about if there were to be a successor, who would that be? And Rishi Sunak is always towards the top of the list. So this is the first time that we're really getting a sense not of how he would act in an emergency, which has defined his time as Chancellor so far, but if he were actually in charge, if he got to oversee the economy in the way that he wanted to do so. And far better circumstances, what would he do? And he essentially has laid out his proposals to tackle the productivity puzzle. How do we generate more growth? How do we make the UK more productive? And he cites capital, people, and ideas. And, and really the idea behind here is that um, while the Tory party at the moment is so focused on spending more money, especially on the National Health Service. Rishi Sunak is more focused on investing in education. I think that's where he would like to see more funds go. But crucially, he does not think that government spending is the way that you're going to generate a better economy. It's a false god, according to the speech that he gives. And again, it's very technical, but if you were to peel back some of those technicalities and really get to what he's saying, he's convinced that you can't just have tax cuts uh, that you're not accounting for. He basically says, you know, tax cuts aren't enough. I'm not convinced that they will always pay for themselves you have to tackle spending too, you have to be fiscally responsible, and then you have to figure out how to generate more growth. He wants to look at tax cuts that would generate more capital investment. He wants to look at tax cuts around AI and those technological innovations that he thinks would be so good for the economy. But it's a very pro-free market speech, and I think a lot of Tories in particular will be interested in that because there has been this increasing divide between the Chancellor and frankly the rest of Cabinet at party conference last year where they they were all talking about low taxes and small state. And Rishi Sunak was the only one who was basically not willing to use those words because let's be frank, we have the highest tax burden in 71 years. COVID has not been the time of the small state. He's been the one to say, look, I'm actually focused on trying to balance the books because it's the only way I think that we can generate economic prosperity in the future. But he really embraces the free market. And I think a lot of Tories were wondering, look, is this guy actually far more centrist than we thought? Um, is he maybe closer to New Labour than he actually is to the Tory party? Not according to this speech. He, he quotes Adam Smith. He fully embraces the market economy. Uh, and I think a, a lot of Tories are probably optimistic to hear that. Um, and it is interesting to see sort of what the Sunak agenda might look like. This is the first time really that we see his vision for the future, not just how he handles emergencies. And James, just finally, um, we have a situation where there's a lot of pressure and expectation amongst Tory MPs and I would say a large chunk of the cabinet that the Tories start cutting taxes ahead of the next election. Um, there's lots of people saying income tax could be where, where they go. Um, is there anything in um, Rishi Sunak's you know, blueprint which uh, suggests this is more likely or less likely? But the, the speech is very much focused on, on business taxes rather than personal taxation. But I think, I think it is clear that he, he wants to move to a kind of lower tax system. But uh, as Kate says, you know, 
his argument is you've got to, you've got to pay for that through, uh, and that has got to involve spending restraint. You know, in this in this divide between you know Thatcher and Reagan, Thatcher felt you had to get the public finances under control before you could cut taxes. Reagan famously said that the deficit was big enough to look after itself. Uh, he is clearly siding with Thatcher over Reagan. I, I think leaving aside all the ideological questions, there, there is a simple pragmatic a reason for this as well. The US, because of the, the dollar's status as a global reserve currency, has far more fiscal flexibility to go for deficit-funded tax cuts than uh, the UK does. And I mean, I mean, I mean that, that is just a reality that, 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 that people in this country uh, need to accept. Thank you, James. Thank you, Kate. Now to COVID. The last of the COVID restrictions in the UK were lifted this week. In the magazine, Matt Ridley sounds an optimistic note. We don't need to worry about a deadly variant coming along um, because ultimately respiratory diseases, he says, almost always get milder. To explain, Matt joins me now. Matt, thank you for joining us on Spectator TV this week. Um, to begin, what did you make of the Prime Minister's living with COVID plan that he unveiled this week? Well, I think it's inevitable. I think it's the right thing to do. And I think it's a huge relief to a lot of people. Uh, we couldn't go on restricting people's movements. We couldn't go on basically, you know, living under a sort of authoritarian regime when nanny knows best. And we don't have to. That's the best thing. You know, we've got to the point where the Omicron wave is fading. Um, deaths didn't go anything like as high as the official experts said just before Christmas. Um, clearly, this is a milder version of the virus. It's not much worse than a cold. It's probably about as bad as a flu. Uh, and the fact that an awful lot of people have had it now means that it's going to struggle to spread as fast anyway. So I think we are through to the point where uh, this is much more like an endemic influenza. And the World Health Organization's David Nabarro suggested it was the wrong move to get rid of so many rules, legal rules. Um, do, do you think the UK is seen as an outlier um, when it comes to the, the global picture on COVID? Well, I think if you look at the UK versus other European countries, we had a, uh, an earlier and pretty bad Omicron wave. Uh, but because we'd opened up somewhat in July last year and because we didn't close down in December, uh, the UK has got through this wave quicker than other countries. So it's just not fair of the World Health Organization and others to sort of try and do a one size fits all recommendation for all countries. It's got to be country specific. Uh, and I think clearly Britain has reached the point um, where it can start to live with the virus because the, the, the effect on people's uh, psychology, their minds, their lives of living under uh, intense restrictions with people telling them what to do and what not to do is not nothing. It is a significant effect. And in the magazine this week, Matt, you write about um, what's going to happen or could happen in terms of strains of the virus. One of the um, arguments you hear against getting rid of so many rules um, is this uh, idea that we could have a new strain, it could be much worse, it could be more dangerous. Um, what do you say to that? I think it's very unlikely that this virus will mutate into a more uh, virulent strain. Uh, respiratory tract viruses, viruses that are, affect the nose and throat, um, on the whole end up mild. There are about 200 different kinds of virus that cause the common cold. None of them kill people normally. All of them are mild. You heard this week that the Queen has mild cold-like symptoms. That's telling you colds are mild. Now that's not a coincidence. Not all viruses evolve milder forms. By no means. Insect-borne ones, water-borne ones, um, sexually transmitted diseases, they can go on killing and they can have variants that, that are more lethal. But if you think about it, with a, with a virus that's spread by coughing and sneezing, on the whole, it's going to spread much faster if the person who has it is feeling OK enough to go to work, to go to parties, etc. And that effect, that selective effect, results in an evolution towards milder forms in respiratory viruses only. Yes, it's interesting what you say about human behaviour, because I think if we think about Omicron, and there was, all, there was very much, as you highlight in your article, a reluctance to say it could be milder. There was lots of sense, you know, saying there wasn't much reason to think this. But then one of the large uh, factors people pointed to was vaccines as a reason that it was less of a threat. But you argue actually often it, it can be more than one thing. And as you say, one of the factors behind this is this idea that 
if you are very ill, you're more likely to stay at home. Um, and that means that the, the more diluted or the less strong variants have a better chance to spread. That's right. There's been a very strange reluctance to admit that Omicron uh, is mild. The uh, South Africans who discovered it found that they came under great pressure not to say that. Um, and we heard a lot of denying of that early on. Um, and then when it did appear that the symptoms were milder, we were told that's just because people have an immune uh, protection through the booster vaccine in particular. Um, and that has obviously had a huge effect. But there is now data published in Nature showing that it, that's not the only effect. The, the, there's also another effect, which is that the virus itself is intrinsically milder. Other things being equal, it gives people a milder version of uh, COVID. That's probably because it doesn't migrate deeper into the lungs or into the bloodstream. It probably stays in the nasal mucosa, something like that. Um, but whatever it is, this is a milder virus. Uh, and that's to be expected that at this point in the evolution of the virus, as long as people are, as it were, free to decide whether they go out or don't go out, then the sicker people are going to stay home or get tested uh, or whatever and the less sick people are going to go are going to sorry let me say that again the less sick people are going to uh, test uh, going to go out and meet other people and so it, it, the less strong variants are, are more likely to spread than the strong ones so i think it's very unlikely that you will see this uh, virus turn virulent again um, uh, any more than you see normal, ordinary, common colds turn virulent? Um, now, we can never be 100% sure of what's going to happen. And you Correct. cite an exception uh, to this rule in your piece, um, the 1918 flu. Can you talk, uh, viewers, through what happened there? Yes, so influenza is, on the whole, a relatively mild disease. Not as mild as colds, and there's a reason for that. It's a, it's a more durable uh, virus. But uh, it... In, in the one exception is the 1918 uh, epidemic. And what happened there was that it did start quite mild, actually. It was only in August 1918 that it suddenly mutated into a really lethal form that started killing people. Now, Professor Paul Ewald has studied this case as well as others, and he comes to the conclusion that what happened there was that in the peculiar conditions of the trenches, um, if a soldier got sick with influenza and he was not too bad, he would go to a dugout and sleep it off and stay in the trenches. If he was really sick, he'd be taken by stretcher bearers to a field hospital, he'd then be put on a train back to England, um, on a crowded troop ship, etc., etc., spreading it to lots and lots of people. Uh, nurses effectively acting as sort of vectors for the disease. So the, the, the strong versions of the virus were spreading better than the mild versions of the virus. Now, I worry that something similar happened during lockdowns uh, in this country, the early lockdowns in particular, um, because in this pandemic, I should say, because uh, although this, you know, this was an intrinsically nasty virus, as they often are when they start off in a new species, um, we weren't putting it under pressure to get milder because we were telling mild cases to stay at home and we were sending severe cases to hospitals where they were more likely to infect healthcare workers and other patients. And just finally, Matt, um, it's interesting in your piece, you mentioned nerve tag as well as a few other um, scientific advisors during the pandemic. A nerve tag when uh, ultimately they said that it was a common misconception that viruses mutate, mutate to be less severe. I just wondered, why do you think there has been such a reluctance to even entertain this as something that could happen? Obviously, we're never going to say for certain there will never be a bad strain again. Um, but, but it seems strange in a way that within the community there's been such a reluctance and you mentioned South Africa and Omicron to even go near it do you think it's because they're worried about the public relaxing or, or what is it? I think there's a natural bias towards pessimism in these bodies because you 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 get into much more trouble if you're too optimistic and you're wrong than if you're too pessimistic and you're too wrong but ever and above that I think there's a special problem here which is that the kind of people being consulted in these expert bodies on the whole, don't know much evolutionary biology. Now, that might seem a harsh thing to say about senior biologists, but actually, if you're a medical scientist, you don't get much training in Darwinism, in understanding how these things work. It's quite subtle stuff 
and you have to to dig under the surface and get to understand how these things happen understand the, the process of selection so for example they always talk about the virus mutating well mutation is only a part of evolution selection is the other part you get mutants some get selected some don't that's what drives evolution and that part often gets left out thank you matt thank you for coming on today Canada's leader, Justin Trudeau, invoked emergency powers this week in a bid to stop protests against vaccine mandates in the country. Truckers, who had formed queues to block supply routes into Canada, found their bank accounts frozen and were declared terrorists by the government. What is Trudeau thinking? To try and work that out, I'm joined now by Spectator contributor Megan Murphy. Megan, thanks for joining us on Spectator TV. Canada is still in a state of emergency over a truckers protest. Can you update viewers on what's been going on? So the truckers have now been cleared out of Ottawa. Um, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau invoked the Emergencies Act, which has never been invoked before in the history of Canada. Um, at one point, it was called the War Measures Act and was invoked back in 1970 by his father, actually, Pierre Trudeau. Um, but it's meant to be used in the case of a, an extreme emergency. Um, and <laughs> so, for example, in the 70s, when Pierre Trudeau in fact invoked the War Measures Act, it was to deal with a terrorist group who had actually murdered and kidnapped a, a politician. And in this case, we're dealing with a protest in Ottawa um, led by working class people, by regular Canadians. There was no violence. Um, it was a, a peaceful protest. Um, they were dancing in the streets. They were barbecuing. They were singing the national anthem. They were playing street hockey. Um, and it was, you know, it's it's really shocking that he's he's taken it to this extreme and and quite scary, in my opinion. And what's the reaction of the general public? How have Canadians reacted um, to the escalation by Trudeau? I mean, it's hard to say. Uh, I can, based on my social media feeds, for example, I can see that it's strange because a lot of leftists have been very much opposed to the protests in Ottawa. Um, and the protests have been framed by the media and the left as a, an extreme right protest, as, you know, they've been labeled terrorists in some cases. I've seen people label them treasonists. Um, and they've definitely been labeled anti-vaxxers over and over again. And, you know, the people at the protests are not anti-vaxxers. They're certainly not terrorists. They're very diverse in terms of politics and, and ethnicity. Um, and they really just want their rights back. They want their lives back. They want their freedoms back. They want their charter rights back. And we're opposing the mandates and restrictions that were ongoing and mostly nonsensical and unnecessary at this point. But, you know, a lot of the leftists, strangely, have supported authoritarianism in all of this. So what the Emergencies Act does is it removes people's civil rights and it allows Justin Trudeau to do things like freeze people's bank accounts. And he has done that. He's frozen the bank accounts of leaders of the protests, but also of some people who donated to the protest, to the convoy. Um, and you know, people should first of all be allowed to donate money to whatever they want to donate money to. It's none of the government's business. But it's, it's just, it's a really specific and scary form of punishment when you can take away somebody's ability to survive because of their political views or beliefs, essentially. And it's very strange to me that the left, of all people, have been supporting this. It seems to me that the left have become very much opposed to the working class and very much the elitists in many ways. I saw some leftists on my, my social media accounts sharing one, one meme, one tweet um, a lot yesterday that was mocking the protesters for being uneducated. Um, you know, 
saying things like, oh, it's really, it's really nice that they held a grad party for people who never graduated from high school. And I just was like, can you hear yourselves? Who have you become? Um, you don't support free speech anymore. You don't support diversity. Um, you're completely intolerant of people who are different than you. And you're denigrating people who are less privileged than you, essentially. Now, this week has seen the UK announce an end to all uh, COVID restrictions. Do you think there's a chance of seeing anything like that in Canada anytime soon, or, or does it feel very far away? I mean, for many of the reasons that we're currently discussing. Well, it's interesting because as soon as the protests began, or shortly thereafter, in any case, across the provinces, the mandates and restrictions were being dropped. So at the provincial level, premiers were deciding, due to this political pressure, to drop the vaccine passports, um, to drop the mask mandates, to drop the restrictions around socializing, and so on and so forth. But at the federal level, Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party are still clinging to these mandates. So despite the fact that it seemed as though Canada was moving on province to province to province, um, Justin Trudeau seems to be maintaining and... It's almost, I, I, I can't say for sure why, but it almost seems like an ego thing. He doesn't want to, to lose this war. Um, you know, we're seeing around the world the mandates and restrictions are being dropped and people are moving on with their lives. And Canada appears to be going in the opposite direction in some ways. So it did seem like things were getting better and then suddenly things got exponentially worse when Justin Trudeau decided to invoke the Emergencies Act. Thank you, Megan. Thanks for joining us today. That's it for this week. Once again, The Spectator is delighted that Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management is sponsoring the week in 60 Minutes. Canaccord will provide the expertise you need to build your wealth of confidence. You can visit candowealth.com to find out more. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to The Spectator's YouTube channel. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and tap the bell icon so you never miss an episode. Thanks for watching and do join us again next week. Mm -hmm.